Okay. I think we're a go, so let's kick things off. I'd like to welcome everyone for all of those participating in this evening's webinar. I'd like to welcome you to our SAE Southern California section. Uh, we have a very exciting program for you this evening. My name is Delbert Boone. I am the current vice chair for the Meeting and Tours Committee. Uh, before we kick things off, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, we have about an hour's worth of content from our subject matter expert on wind tunnel testing. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a short Q&A session. So for those participants wanting to ask questions, simply type in your question in the Q&A chat box and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. For those looking to follow SA SoCal or wanting additional information on membership, or where to find us on social media. You can see in the middle of the page, we have our saesocal.org web link. We also have a presence on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel, SAE SoCal. And then I'd just like to up cover a couple of upcoming events. Uh, tonight, as mentioned, we have a history of SoCal wind tunnel testing. On the 19th, uh, SA MidCal, our MidCal brethren, they have a student panel uh, on Formula SAE, and that will be a meetup. On November 9th, we'll have our Art Center Transportation Design uh, entitled Balance of Art and Engineering. And then rounding out November the 16th through the 18th uh, will be Commotion LA uh, in conjunction with the LA Auto Show. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce a colleague from the Meeting and Tours Committee uh, who will introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Uh, so take it away, Darius. Hi. Hi. I'd like to introduce our main speaker today. Rami Adersing is a recently graduated master's student in mechanical engineering from California State University, Fullerton. At CSUF, Rami worked to renovate the university's subsonic wind tunnel testing and is, has designed a bespoke rolling road system to further university's aerodynamic testing capabilities. From 2014 to 2020, Rami was the aerodynamicist for the Jaeger Racing Time Attack team and developed the team's aerodynamic testing program and strategy. Today, he has prepared a short presentation outlining the historical role Southern California has played toward the development of race car wind tunnel testing and open wheel and sports car racing. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Darius. Um, You, you can see my uh, my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so just to start off, if uh, you have any questions that I don't cover today, uh, feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to try and answer it to the best of my ability. Um, just to start off, uh, Cal State Fullerton right now is doing a lot of exciting work in vehicle aerodynamics. Uh, we're currently building our wind tunnel capability to be able to do these sorts of um, problems. So if this is something that interests you, uh, just for a plug for Cal State Fullerton, I just uh, say to uh, take a look at Cal State Fullerton's engineering programs. Now, to start off with, um, sometimes aerodynamics is called like a black art, but in reality, um, it's a very scientific exploration. But what do aerodynamics actually investigate? And there are two main broad categories of what aerodynamics look at. First, it's qualitative analysis. What does the flow look like? And sometimes you'll see this a lot in movies. Um, it's called tough testing uh, is one of them. And this is a picture on the left of the electromotive uh, GTO um, car, um, the Datsun being tested at Riverside Raceway uh, back in, I believe the early eighties. And on the right um, is the other category of aerodynamic testing is uh, understanding the forces that act on the car. And this is the same car um, now with a bunch of uh, pressure uh, gauges uh, with hoses attached all around the car to measure the pressures around the car. Now, when we use our aerodynamic tools, we actually have three uh, other categories um, that we do our testing in. The first is track testing. And typically this is the final stage evaluation um, for most aerodynamic testing programs because 
while track testing gives us the only true representation of the aerodynamic behavior of the car, there's also a lot of um, random effects that the environment creates that we can't really control. So one thing we can do is do something called wind tunnel testing, where essentially we take all the benefits of track testing. So the fact that we're physically measuring a, a real um, airstream, but we put it in a, a very controlled environment where we can remove a lot of the random fluctuations that nature gives us uh, to find data that's um, easy to find trends and correlations with. And finally, there's computer simulation. And this is more of a recent thing, I would say for the era that we'll be looking at today, computer simulation was just very on the forefront. So there wasn't a lot of computer simulation that's done, but one of the benefits of computer simulation is that um, it's very cost-effective. Like it, all we pay for is uh, computing time. So computer simulation is a very powerful tool for initial concept um, ideas, but it's a slow tool if we want to look at uh, different uh, changes, um, like say right height changes or roll changes. So for that reason, the wind tunnel still has uh, a lot of applicability in race car design. Now, um, I think one quote that really encompasses all these methods is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. None of these method, uh, methods, um, track testing, wind tunnel testing, or computer simulation are perfect, um, and all of them have errors in some sort of way. But if you use um, at least um, two of them, you can get an understanding of where you need to take your car uh, to get the best type of performance. Now, since we're talking about wind tunnel testing uh, today, I want to bring up two really big issues with wind tunnel testing that really kind of drive the development of the SoCal uh, race car wind tunnel testing. Um, the first one is that the results you get are only as good as the equipment. And, and while this might seem like a fairly obvious statement, um, it has some interesting implications because for a long time in this period, there was a huge debate on uh, how ground effects type uh, cars should be tested. And as we'll get into it later on, the, the divide was between, can we just run a traditional wind tunnel with a, a non-stationary floor, or do we need uh, a moving floor in order to properly simulate the aerodynamics. And this was an issue because um, a lot of the prototype cars of this era were uh, having these liftoff cases where the cars would uh, hit um, hills um, and actually fly up in the air and crash. And this happened to a, a multiple different cars and they couldn't really figure out why. And part of the reason was that some of the testing that was being done was being done on wind tunnels that weren't um, appropriate for this type of work. Now, the other big area and issue is the model scale uh, problems. Uh, typically, when we do wind tunnel tests, we do them um, in a scale size, and this also introduces error. And so to give an example, this is a 124th scale uh, wind tunnel test. We did at Cal State Fullerton on the Jaeger racing car. And this is a very extreme case. Like, typically, you don't test at this small scale, but um, to understand why this is an issue, we have to look at something called uh, the Reynolds number and the Reynolds scaling issue. So the Reynolds number is a non-dimensional number used by aerodynamicists uh, just to kind of characterize the physics um, of the fluid flow. Now, one of the strong things about the Reynolds number is that we can um, take a scaled model, um, and as long as our scale model's Reynolds number matches the full scale Reynolds number, we can say that the wind tunnel test that's done at scale matches the flow physics of the full scale. But in order to do this, we have to be able to match that, right? So if we want to figure out for this 124 scale model what the test velocity should be, we find that um, it's 24 times the, the full scale velocity. So if you want to simulate the, uh, the flow physics at 100 miles an hour, your test velocity has to be 24 times that, which is not practical. You cannot do this in, in most wind tunnels. And at this point, the velocity is so high, you have to start looking at other things such as compressibility effects. So oftentimes uh, when we do scale uh, wind tunnel testing, we actually run with a huge Reynolds number uh, mismatch. And the problem with that is that sometimes this means that 
the flow physics aren't exactly 100% uh, um, correct with the full scale. So we have to be careful about the size of the model that we uh, use. Now, we can also run um, with a denser fluid. So sometimes um, some organizations will use a water tunnel instead or a variable density tunnel, but this also has its own challenges. And finally, um, for this reason, automotive aerodynamicists I generally don't like to test in smaller scales. And by smaller scales, what I mean is typically in the race car industry, I think anything under one fifth scale uh, isn't really done. Like for example, right now, I think in Formula One, uh, they test at 60% scale. And most of the cars we'll be talking about today tested at 40 to 50% scale. Now, um, the first historical example I wanna talk about is Caltech and the 10 foot tunnel. And part of the reason why I want to talk about this is that um, this story isn't as well known um, in the race car world. Now, the Caltech tunnel was built in 1926 and was one of Southern California's largest wind tunnels uh, for many years. Um, it operated from, uh, I think, um, the late 1920s up until 1997. And a bunch of aircraft uh, were tested in this tunnel. Um, this tunnel was, was responsible for a lot of the design of World War II fighter aircrafts. And um, there's a lot of building aerodynamics work that was done here as well as automotive aerodynamics work. And this picture is just to show the sheer size uh, of this tunnel. Now, the Caltech tunnel is um, an example of something called a closed return wind tunnel. And this is a very important idea because there are two main categories of wind tunnels. There's the closed return wind tunnel. And the idea behind the closed return wind tunnel is to have a defined uh, flow path for the air uh, to travel around in. And this is important because if you have a design, defined uh, flow path, you can really control the quality of the air coming into your test section area. Um, and at the same time, uh, it requires less power for the fan to run. So if you're doing a long amounts of testing, it's actually quite cheaper to run um, a closed circuit uh, wind tunnel. Now, you can also have something called an open return wind tunnel. And in this case, all it is is that air doesn't have a defined path to come back to the inlet. It just goes in one way and out the other and has to find its kind of own way back. Now, the benefit of an open return wind tunnel is that they take up less space and they're a lot less costly to build. And we'll see that some of the organizations um, that use wind tunnels actually use the open return wind tunnel, whilst others use the closed return wind tunnel concept. Now for a closed return wind tunnel, a very important feature are these things called turning vanes at the edges. And they're essentially airfoil shaped and their entire goal is just to gently uh, turn the airflow around um, so that it doesn't separate at the corners and introduce um, a lot of turbulence and energy loss um, in the, the flow field. In the front is a feature that all wind tunnels have, and this is called the nozzle. And the idea of the nozzle is to um, rapidly accelerate the airflow um, out of the fan uh, to the speed that we want. And at the speeds that we're talking about, which is um, considered the low speed uh, regime of, of um, aerodynamics, um, when you have an area constriction, you have uh, an increase in uh, flow velocity and a decrease in pressure. And this is an important concept that we'll look at a little bit later on. Now in the back, we have something called the diffuser and its goal is opposite of the nozzle. The idea of the diffuser is to very gently expand the area, thereby slowing down the flow velocity and gently increasing the pressure. And the reason uh, that this exists is to help the fan uh, work a little less harder. Like the fan has to work against a pressure difference. And so if you have a high pressure difference, uh, the fan has to work much harder in order to get the uh, flow rate that you want through the wind tunnel. At the same time, the geometry of the diffuser has to be made in such a way that it expands the airflow, but it doesn't cause flow separation to occur, which can um, reduce uh, the results, um, the quality of the airflow in the wind tunnel itself. And finally, we have the middle part, which is probably arguably the most important part, the test section, which as the name implies, um, is where we put models in and measure our forces. 
Now, uh, the Caltech Tunnel did a lot of different automotive aerodynamics programs, but probably the most famous is the Chevy Corvette program uh, in the 1960s. And I believe Chevy used this tunnel up until about the 1980 when they introduced their own uh, wind tunnel in Michigan. But as far as race cars go, the most famous example that was done um, at Caltech was a Golden Ron land speed car. Now this car was built by Bob and Bill Summers of Ontario, California. Um, it was powered by four Chrysler Hemi V8s and had a total horsepower output of 2,400. Now, initially when they designed this car in the first iteration, they were having a very hard time actually hitting any sort of speed that would be um, competitive for land speed racing. And they thought they actually had um, a powertrain issue. So, the story goes that they went to a very uh, well-respected um, either engine or a feelings um, system uh, designer, and they were kind of trying to figure out what the issue was. And when that person kind of suggested that perhaps that they had an aerodynamics issue, not a powertrain issue. So they ended up enlisting um, the help of uh, Walter Korf of Lockheed to design uh, the body of this car. And through a series of very meticulous uh, work at the Caltech tunnel, they were able to design a body with a drag coefficient of 0.116, which is very low when you consider that even today, some of our best passenger cars are at like 0 0.19, 0 0.2. Um, and this held the wheel driven record officially up until 2008. And this is a picture of them actually testing the car uh, in the Caltech tunnel. Now, there's actually an SAE paper on the development of this car that uh, Walter Korf had made, if you're interested to get a really detailed look at what he did in the design. And personally, I love this last sentence in the um, abstract. The golden rod appears to have sufficient potential to also challenge the world speed record for piston engine aircraft. So quite remarkable of what this car was capable of doing. This also brings up another concept I'd like to give about um, aerodynamic forces and power. So if we look at the drag force equation, and the downforce equation, one thing that we can note is that these both scale with velocity squared. So as velocity increases, um, the benefit or, or the negative parts of uh, aerodynamic forces uh, are magnified rapidly. Now, when we think about power, we have to realize that power is nothing but force times velocity by definition. So if we want to estimate the power that's lost to the, to the drag, we can see that um, it scales with velocity cubed. So power loss becomes a huge issue uh, as uh, the velocity increases. And for a land speed car, uh, considering this aerodynamically optimized body, we can see that at 409 miles an hour, this car was losing over a quarter of its total horsepower output to drag. This is power that cannot be used to accelerate the car. But imagine if they had used um, a, a body that had a, a similar drag coefficient to what was typical at the time, 0.4. Well, then you'd be close to losing 1600 horsepower or almost half the total, or actually over half the uh, total horsepower output uh, of this car. So for land speed cars, um, aerodynamics is very important and was this was known for quite a while. But even though the aerodynamics um, for land speed racing was known, until the 1960s really, the benefit of aerodynamics for uh, circuit racing was unknown, really. Um, but this all changed uh, through the work of Caltech alumnus uh, Jim Hall. Jim Hall realized um, while he was doing evaluations of uh, his race cars that he could actually use um, the uh, vertical force uh, provided by aerodynamics to increase traction on tires and increase cornering speeds and thereby decrease lap times. Now, the 1966 Chaparral 2E was probably the most famous uh, one of his cars and really um, was the birth of uh, modern um, race car aerodynamics as we know it today. And I want to really highlight kind of how forward thinking Jim Hall was on the design of this car. Not only did he realize that he could use an inverted wing to um, 
increase the traction on the car, but he realized that the best way to add downforce to this car was to make sure that the wing was directly connected to the hubs of the um, suspension. Because when you traditionally put a wing hard mounted to the body, the wing has to transfer its load to the body and then from the body to the suspension. And this has a negative effect of um, pitching the car. So the rear of the car will gain downforce, but the front will uh, lose downforce. And so then you have to add downforce on the front to compensate for that pitching effect, but that reduces downforce in the rear. Jim Hall realized that if he could devise a way to directly add load to the tires, he would uh, get around that a negative pitching effect. So I thought that was um, quite remarkable uh, for the time. The other probably really interesting uh, aspect was that this is a driver adjustable um, angle of attack for the wing. So uh, the driver could have the car at maximum downforce uh, in the corners and then trim it off for zero uh, drag on the straights, which uh, if you think about it, this is a DRS system in 1966. So quite ahead of anything that anyone else was thinking of at that time. Now, when we think of aerodynamics, I think probably most people who have st started in this subject um, since uh, the 90s have picked up uh, the book of Dr. Joseph Katz. This is a starting point for probably most aerodynamicists uh, today. Um, Dr. Katz uh, is a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at San, San Diego State. And when I was talking to him, he told me that uh, one of his first things uh, when he was doing race car aerodynamics was um, to investigate uh, radiator cooling flows in race cars. Uh, he noticed that a lot of the ducting solutions that uh, NASCAR teams and some of the IndyCar teams were having didn't really make sense fluid dynamically. And he started uh, figuring out that he could do tough testing and he had created uh, this tiny, really compact uh, video camera to actually record the behavior and he was able to show that a lot of these uh, commonplace ideas of ducting for race cars simply did not work and they were actually doing the opposite effect of bringing airflow into the radiator. Um, and then probably his most famous contribution again is this book and this book actually has an interesting story as well because um, this book is actually the compilation of a lot of like notes that he had had that he had learned when trying to apply fluid dynamics theory to race car construction. And he uh, had compiled this uh, handbook and he had used it on a lot of his consulting work. And he happened to be going on a motorcycle ride with Ross Bentley and the subject of this uh, handbook came up. And Ross Bentley uh, convinced him to publish this book um, as a, a manual for other people to learn race car aerodynamics. And apparently when this book first came out, it was quite controversial because uh, race car aerodynamics was considered um, kind of like a black art, like a, a thing that some people knew uh, from the scientific perspective, but no one wanted to give away the secret. And so when this book came out, it kind of caused a stir because now it was out in the open of ways you could approach uh, race car design from a scientific point of view. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of people are glad that he did because it allowed a lot of people to get their start in race car aerodynamics. Um, he's done a lot of work for INSA teams um, and he's done all the Rod Millen's cars. Um, and this is a picture of the famous uh, Pikes Peak uh, Tundra here. And um, he's, done, uh, he's done consulting for multiple race teams and multiple different disciplines. Uh, he has a lot of SAE papers on his work in uh, IndyCar aerodynamics. And one of the first people to use CFD in race car development, and this is kind of an important thing as we'll see later on. Now the San Diego State wind tunnel to give some specifications of it, um, it's 32 inches tall by 45 inches wide and 67 inches long. It has a 150 horsepower motor uh, and a four blade fan. It can test anywhere from zero to 180 miles an hour. And like Caltech, it is a closed return wind tunnel. This is one of uh, the more famous studies that uh, he's done. This was a study to investigate uh, ground effect vortex dynamics. And one thing 
that they realized in the 90s with indie cars was that um, vortices played a huge role in the creation and, sus and sustaining downforce with ground effect cars. Um, but one of the disadvantages of a rolling uh, road wind tunnel is that it's, it's hard to visualize what's going on uh, dynamically when, they're, uh, when the airflow is moving. So he created um, a flat, um, like a uh, glass a looking hole uh, on the bottom of the San Diego State wind tunnel where he could actually uh, put tufts on the car and view how the, the vortices changed um, while the airflow was moving. Now, he was also one of the first to uh, take this idea and run a full um, CFD study um, of this kind of phenomena. And uh, in this era, like CFD, there were like kind of two camps. Like there was um, something called a panel method, which is a much uh, simpler way of doing um, simulations where you don't look at all the effects of the fluid equations. And then there's something uh, called the full Navier-Stokes or the RANS equations, which um, if anyone does CFD, they're probably quite familiar with. And at this time, it was very hard to do RANS simulations. There's just like a lot of hard computing uh, requirements. So this was one of the first studies where they used RANS on an IndyCar type uh, body to investigate um, the vortex development. And probably his most proud car was the Mazda 92P. And um, this car was one of the first uh, to use CFD uh, in its design. So this was done, I think the development of this car was late 80s, early 90s. So this was done, I believe, with something called a panel method. And why that's important is up until this point, uh, they only used CFD for the wings. Uh, they didn't really trust CFD for the rest of the car development. So he was one of the first to try and see um, how close he could get um, a computational method to the wind tunnel. Uh, and this would kind of drive kind of the future of where the race car industry was headed. Now, when you talk about Southern California wind tunnels, one name always pops up and that's Trevor Harris. And uh, when I started this, um, uh, looking into this, uh, this entire presentation, um, a couple people told me, you need to talk to Trevor Harris. He is the father of Southern California uh, race car wind tunnels. And when you see his history, you can understand why that statement was made. Now, a brief bio on Trevor Harris. Um, He's been a race car designer since the 1950s, and he's had a lot of success um, in many different types of racing disciplines. Um, but his interest in aerodynamics uh, started in 1963. He had developed uh, this sports car, um, and he said that when he was making passes at Pacific Raceway, he, he said that the um, spectators noticed that the car was actually lifting a lot. And he was kind of curious to find out why this was happening. So. He had a background in uh, electronics instrumentation from his work uh, as a Boeing uh, engineer. And he actually measured, um, he used like um, electronic equipment to measure uh, the lift of the car. Uh, and that kind of began his interest um, in aerodynamic development. Um, he's probably most well known for the radical uh, Shadow Can-Am car. And there's actually a really great uh, SAE presentation uh, by I think uh, Pete Lyons on this, on this car. Uh, that I would highly suggest watching. Um, he's also the chassis designer for the BRE Datsun 510s. So he's the one who's responsible for making those cars as competitive as they are. He was the designer for the 1981 and 1983 All-American Racers IndyCar, and also the designer for the 87 to 92 Electromotive GTP cars uh, on the chassis side. So Trevor Harris's interest in ground effect aerodynamics uh, was largely driven by the Shadow DN9 and this smokestack device. So the story goes that um, in this era, they used to sculpt the side pods of the cars as essentially giant inverted um, airfoils. And the, the idea was to build the car as close as you could to a wing. Now, the problem with that is that um, like a wing, um, the downforce or the lift force that it'll make is based on the angle of attack. And if you go more and more aggressive on the angle of attack, you'll make more downforce up until a point where the boundary layer gets very large uh, and there's a large uh, adverse pressure that, that pushes against it and causes the flow to separate. 
And once the separation happens, you lose a lot of your downforce production. So Trevor thought, well, why not um, build some type of device where assuming that the pressure is a lot lower on, on the, up, uh, the top side of this airfoil, maybe we could suck up some of this uh, boundary layer growth um, and keep the flow attached. And so they built this device and they actually tested it at the Mirror Wind Tunnel. And the Mirror Wind Tunnel, for those that don't know, is a full-scale wind tunnel facility in the UK, uh, but it does not have a moving floor. And this becomes very important because in the mirror wind tunnel, they actually show that this device works and it works very well. So they go ahead and they add this on the car, but they don't see any uh, benefit from it. The drivers don't really notice a lot of difference. And they happen to be at a race where I think a car in front of them has an engine failure and there's a bunch of oil to spill on the track. Uh, the shadow DN9 happens to run over it. Um, and when they pull the car into the pits, Trevor goes to look at the smokestack to, to see, well, if this actually works, there should have been oil that blew out of the, the stack. But when he looks, he finds that actually, in actuality, the, the airflow patterns are going inside into the airfoil. So all this time, the smokestack was actually drawing in air and kind of spoiling the air at the underside of uh, the, the car and kind of losing downforce. And to understand why this happens, uh, you have to understand that um, the concept of kind of the boundary layer growth. So in the real environment, uh, the, the ground and the air are stationary relative to each other, um, but the car moves. But in the wind tunnel, we do the opposite thing. We move the air and we keep the car stationary. But the problem is in the traditional wind tunnel, the ground is stationary. So we get this kind of um, boundary layer buildup or an area where uh, the flow doesn't match, uh, the, the airflow uh, speed changes uh, based on its, off of its vertical height. Uh, so this kind of uh, effect is not uh, physical. It doesn't capture reality. When we do aircraft testing though, it's not a huge issue because we just run the, the models outside of this uh, boundary layer effect. But for ground vehicle aerodynamics, we're always stuck on the ground. So we have to deal with this effect. The way we get around this is to put a moving belt that actually gets rid of that boundary layer growth and um, correctly simulates the, the relative velocities between the air and, and the ground. But for a long time, there was a huge argument between uh, the automotive aerodynamics community whether this was really uh, beneficial. Now, if you correctly simulate ground effects, one thing that you find is that as you bring a body closer and closer to the ground, the pressure on the underside dramatically drops up to a certain point. And by doing that and coupling uh, this dramatic drop with the large uh, area of uh, the underside of a car, you can dramatically increase the amount of downforce that a car makes. Um, but on the other side, um, kind of recovering that pressure uh, becomes harder. So it's like this uh, delicate balance between getting your car on the right height where it generates a lot of downforce versus getting into a part where your flow separates um, and you lose downforce. Now, after realizing kind of some of these uh, intricacies of the, the smokestack arrow issue, uh, Trevor moved back to the United States um, and decided to build his own wind tunnel in his garage. So he builds a two foot by two foot by 15 foot um, wind tunnel with wood, I think from Home Depot and a fan that he buys off Granger. Granger. Uh, and he makes a data acquisition system full of 72 manometers. And for those that uh, aren't aware, a, a manometer is a very, very simple way of measuring pressure. And so this is a, a basic demonstration I made uh, where essentially all you do is you take a plastic uh, tube, fill it with colored water, um, and you attach the ends to different uh, pressure areas. And the, the flow will change in height uh, based off of the, the higher end will go to the lower pressure side and the lower end is at the higher pressure side. And you can measure this difference in height and from the density of the fluid, figure out what your pressure difference is. It's a very affordable way of doing uh, pressure measurement. 
So these are some pictures of, of his 1980s um, ground effects models that he was testing. I don't know if he's ever showed this to anyone, but um, he built these models to kind of test uh, and understand uh, ideas of ground effect aerodynamics. And you had to realize that uh, during this period of time, uh, this is kind of revolutionary because it was only in 19, I think, 78 that Lotus came out with the first ground effects race car. So this was very much uh, brand new ideas and brand new technology that people weren't really thinking of at the time. And some things on these models that I want to highlight. So say this first uh, blue colored one, uh, he's investigating uh, the effect of doing like a blown slot or a kind of like a slot gap here. So air can flow through and kind of uh, merge with the airflow underneath here. And he's looking at, I would imagine he's looking at to see if he can get away with running a large expansion angle and not having separation by having the slot gap here. The other one, this larger tunnel, um, he's looking at the average pressures at nine different spots on, on this uh, wind tunnel model. And this model ends up, and the data from this ends up um, becoming very important. Because uh, one day he takes this data and he shows it to Dan Gurney and John Ward of all American racers. And John Ward becomes very interested in the results of um, that large uh, wind tunnel test, uh, large wind tunnel uh, model test. Because at this time, Indy cars are also getting into the ground effects era. And so they decide to build a small rolling road wind tunnel, um, partially based off of the advice of Trevor Harris. And this marks the beginning of the All-American Racers Wind Tunnel Program, which, as we'll see later on, um, they kind of build up into a much nicer facility. Now, this experience was also really helpful because a couple of years later, Trevor is hired by Electromotive um, to design their, the chassis for the car. And around this time when this is happening, um, they're evaluating building a wind tunnel for their GTP program. And Trevor Harris kind of tells them that if they're going to build a wind tunnel, it needs to be a rolling road wind tunnel. So this brings us to the story of Electromotive. And I really love this story because it kind of gives you an idea of what can be done when you don't have a lot of resources and how you can still be very competitive if the rule set um, allows a lot of uh, creative um, innovation. So briefly, uh, um, I'm going to give a history of Electromotive, but it doesn't really do justice to how innovative uh, this team was. So if you want a, a much more in-depth look at what Electromotive did and the history behind the team, I'd suggest uh, taking a look at this book by Chris Willis. Um, most of my pictures are actually from his book. And this book has over 400 pages on kind of the ideas um, of the team and kind of the trials and tribulations of what they went to develop uh, what they did. So the, the team is formed by John Nepp in uh, 1973. Uh, Don Devendorf teams up with John in 1974, and their combination is what really creates Electromotive into the powerhouse that it was in this time. The team's based in uh, El Segundo, and they have a lot of initial success uh, building Datsuns for INSA and SSCA racing. They decided in 1983 that they're going to start looking into a GTP program, and this is the highest class of racing for INSA at this time. And they start uh, planning and building the wind tunnel. Um, Yoshi Suzuka is hired as an aerodynamicist in 84. And Suzuka becomes probably the key person that uh, really makes uh, this car very competitive. And this car, uh, the GTP car of Electromotive, ends up um, being the first car to be able to defeat the Porsche 962 prototype, which at that time, was kind of the dominant tour de force uh, in IMSA racing. Uh, and they won the Constructors Championship in 1989 and 1990. So this is a picture of um, the Electromotive wind tunnel. And this is an open return wind tunnel and a blow-through wind tunnel. And by blow-through, what, what I mean is that the, the fan is placed uh, in front of the model, which typically you don't do. Um, it's, it's not as preferred. And that's because um, some of the random effects that come off the uh, the fan blades can affect the model, um, but probably part of the benefit and maybe one of the reasons why they did it like this was that by doing like this, you don't have to have um, a large diffuser um, at the end um, to help the fan as much. So 
this is probably more space compact and probably a little bit cheaper uh, to make. The fan itself was 60 inches in diameter and had a 100 horsepower uh, Lincoln motor. And this allowed them to test uh, with a test speed of 70 miles an hour. Now this scale is one seventh scale or 14% um, scale model. And so this is a, a lot smaller than what was uh, considered the norm uh, of the day, but um, they were able to still get some very good data. And I think partially this is partly due to the very open rule set um, of IMSA at that time. And it's known that this wind tunnel had some unusually good correlation for its scale size um, at its original location. And to this day, no one can figure out why the correlation was so good, but it's like one of the best that uh, Yoshi Suzuka has ever worked on apparently, uh, even though it was such a small scale wind tunnel. This is a picture of construction of the nozzle. Um, as you can see, it's made out of wood. And I think this is all also just built from Home Depot. Um, these are the spars that end up becoming lined to the nozzle structure itself. Uh, I kind of like this story a lot, but uh, in order to make this tunnel work, you need to have something called a flow straightener, which uh, kind of uh, keeps the, the flow aligned um, in the direction that you want it. And typically you would buy a honeycomb material to make this, but they didn't have the budget for this. So what they ended up doing was buying a fiberglass patio shade from Home Depot essentially making their own um, flow straightener um, out of it. Uh, this is a pitot tube that's used for airspeed measurement. Um, so this kind of gives an idea of where um, the main tunnel flow velocity is at, and they can use this to set up the speed of the rolling road itself. Here, they're investigating with something called a wire mount system. So, this isn't used that much today. Uh, I think this was kind of popular in the 80s, but um, however you mount your model is always a challenge because it's going to interfect, um, interfect uh, the flow field wherever it mounts to the model. So the idea behind doing this wire mount system was that you could uh, have a very minimal impact uh, on the model flow itself. In the back is a sting mount, and this is uh, used to kind of get the force measurements of the car. This, this is connected to a load cell that gives you the downforce and drag values. So this is a picture of the rolling road itself. Um, and one thing I'd like to note is that, that they used a belt sander um, belt for uh, the main rolling road track. And to a certain extent, this is kind of quite genius actually, because um, the re in reality, the surface that a car goes on is not smooth like most conveyor belts are. In reality, it's very rough. So by using a conveyor belt, uh, they're able to very cheaply simulate the roughness uh, of the road. The downside is that the belt itself is not as strong in comparison to a conveyor belt. But if your model scale is very small, your forces are also very small on it. So you could probably get away with something like this. Um, at this time, they didn't have electronically controlled speed on the motor, so they had a mechanical drive system, which they would change pulley sizes in order to get to the test speed that they wanted. And uh, in their wind tunnel, um, everything was kind of like um, based off of mechanical pressure gauges. They didn't have uh, fancy data acquisition systems, and partially this is due to the time when this was made. This tunnel was constructed in the early to mid 80s, so in this time, uh, electronic data acquisition was still fairly a, a new thing. So what they had to do was first set up the tunnel, get it up to speed, match the wind speed um, and the belt speed of the rolling road. And then um, once everything was set, look at uh, the values, write them down, and then do a configuration change and, and run over and over and over again. Now, this is a picture of the model. And what I'd like to show is that um, relative to some of the other models, you'll see this is fairly simple. And uh, in one way, this is great because it saves a lot of the cost, but it's also an example of because the rule set was um, fairly wide open, they didn't have to get as detailed um, as some of the other cars that you'll see. So they were able to look at big picture concepts and still generate large amounts of downforce. 
uh, I really like this a lot. This is a, a picture from Yoshi's um, notebook where he's actually investigating the use of boss gases to keep flow attached and reduce boundary layer growth on a diffuser. So this is a blown diffuser in 1986. And he actually rigs up a system on the, um, the wind tunnel model to be able to test this. So I thought this was quite fascinating. Uh, so this is a picture of them uh, load, uh, testing one of their uh, dual element wings. And um, in red is actually Yoshi Suzuka. So for anyone who's familiar with Time Attack, um, Yoshi Suzuka is also um, apparently the mentor uh, of Andrew Brilliant. Uh, so Yoshi Suzuka has a kind of a famous kind of connection between IMSA and also Time Attack. Now, on the other hand, at the same time uh, was uh, Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. And again, I'm only going to give a very brief overview of their history. There's a great video that was done by the Peterson Museum that kind of goes over all their cars, their facility, um, and the history of this um, organization. So I highly recommend watching it if you had the chance. Now, All American Racers was originally founded by Dan Gurney and Carol Shelby in 1964. Uh, they participated in a lot of different racing series, um, including F1, IndyCar, Heart, uh, Trans Am, and IMSA, where they're probably the most um, As far as I know, they're the only American constructor to win a Formula One race. Um, it's the 1967 Belgian Grand Prix at Spa. Uh, and they had a very successful partnership with Toyota uh, in IMSA. And I think one of their last projects that they built was the Delta Wing. So this is a picture of the All-American Racers Tunnel. Um, this is also an open return tunnel, but it's a draw through, meaning that the fan is placed at the back. And as you can see, kind of the difference uh, in the eras uh, between the Electromotive and All-American Racers. Now, for the All-American Racers, they actually have a control room full of computer controlled data acquisition and actually control programs where they can vary the ride height and the pitch. And the tunnel that I'm showing was originally created um, in 1993 and further um, developed towards the 2000s. So uh, they probably took the lessons that they learned from their early 1980s tunnels uh, to develop this tunnel that we see here. Some specifications on it, um, it had 100 horsepower, a motor that drove the fan. Um, its test section was 35 inches high by 60 inches um, uh, wide by 123 inches long. It had a max airspeed of 108 miles an hour, and its rolling road um, had a maximum speed of 105 miles an hour. And this tunnel uh, could accommodate 40 to 50% scale models. And uh, this is quite interesting because um, if you notice, the model actually in, in takes up uh, quite a bit of the testing area of this wind tunnel, which actually can be a problem, but they had a unique solution to this. Um, one interesting feature of this wind tunnel is that the mount itself is not connected to the wind tunnel itself. It's its own separate structure. And the reason why you do this is um, you're always trying on a wind tunnel test to eliminate random sources uh, of oscillation and noise that don't have anything to do with uh, aerodynamic effects because that, that makes the data harder to find correlations or issues with. So if this mount to the car was uh, attached directly to the wind tunnel, all the vibrations that come for the wind tunnel fan and the rolling road would be transferred to the load cell. So by having a separate structure that's also designed in such a way where it can damp out vibrations, you only get the aerodynamic forces um, in the load cell itself. Now, this wind tunnel also has something called a pre-boundary layer suction. And the idea here is that the rolling road will not allow uh, boundary layer growth to happen. But if there's a boundary layer that happens uh, ahead of the rolling road, it actually, that growth will get transported along the rolling road itself. So you have to have a system that actually sucks out uh, uh, entering boundary layer as well. And this is the actual rolling road system itself um, with a couple of suction chambers. And this is uh, a picture of the rolling road at its new place uh, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. 
Now, you might be wondering, why do you need a suction chamber on this rolling road device? And uh, part of the reason has to do with this ground effect idea. Uh, as I said earlier, as the car gets lower and lower to the ground, the pressure dramatically drops. Well, what happens is that this causes a force that causes the belt to be pushed up towards the, um, the car. And this is uh, highly uh, undesirable because it uh, gives false readings um, in the wind tunnel test. So you counteract that by suction to bring that belt back down. But the problem is that when you do that, uh, now you increase the sliding frictures, friction. So you get a lot of temperature in this uh, device. So what uh, all American racers did was they actually drilled cooling jackets um, in their rolling road um, plate uh, and ran coolant through it to control the temperature. And on the right is kind of a, um, a simulation that I ran of their cooling system to try and evaluate um, how the temperature would look for different parameters. Now, uh, this is a picture of the suction holes of this uh, rolling road. So there are 1,100 suction holes um, in total on this uh, rolling road device. And they're placed in such a way that um, they're kind of distributed amongst uh, the areas of the model that create the most um, downforce or will have the lowest pressure. So that would be the front wing, the under tray area, um, the rear diffuser, um, and also uh, around kind of uh, the tires as well. The other interesting thing is uh, these uh, underbelt tire supports uh, and the rollers to reduce friction. But one thing um, that would be interesting, and I'm not sure if um, the All-American Racers did this or not, but um, modern wind tunnels will actually use these and attach load cells to them so that you can get um, a tire force reading as well. But I'm not sure if this was done on this rolling road or not. Now, uh, these couple pictures kind of show the progression of the tech rolling road um, testing technology. So here you can see that the tire is not connected to the model at all, versus later on, um, the tire is actually connected to the model. And so assuming that um, these are from two different eras, um, the reasoning it has to come with a uh, vibration. A long time ago, um, they didn't have a good way of uh, removing the vibration that happens from the, the tire spinning on the rolling road from the load cell reading of the, uh, the model itself. So they used to have them separated so that you could still have the effect of the spinning tire, but its vibrations wouldn't be transferred into the model itself. And if they wanted to read the loads of the tires, what they would do is they would add a load cell um, to these beams right here and kind of measure uh, the tire lift forces as well. But the problem is that by having this kind of strut out there, you're, you're introducing something that's not physical. You're introducing a wake that doesn't exist in real life, can uh, alter the wind tunnel um, simulation as well. Now, um, onto an earlier topic I brought up. Uh, why does this wind tunnel have these slotted walls? It's kind of unusual. And the reason is, um, if you think about this concept of wind tunnel blockage, so say we have airflow uh, and we have a special wind tunnel that doesn't have any walls. Well, the air will be hypothetically naturally able to flow around the car without much obstruction. But if we introduce walls, this compacts uh, the air around the car. And so by compacting the air, if you recall my discussion of the wind tunnel nozzle, uh, by reducing this area, now the air speeds, uh, the, the air is going to artificially up and the, the pressure and velocity data will be wrong. Uh, it won't be accurate. So you have to somehow compensate for this. Now, in aerospace, it's commonly um, common uh, to be able to correct uh, up to a 10% blockage. So 10% of this total area um, can block the total cross section of the wind tunnel area. But this is kind of a disadvantage because as our automotive aerodynamicists, we kind of want the largest models that we can. So if you're constrained by size, uh, you don't really want to have to make your model smaller. So one thing you can do is actually uh, add gaps in your uh, wind tunnel walls and intentionally bleed out some, some of the uh, air 
and mitigate some of those local acceleration effects. And if you're very careful and do a lot of calibration, you can actually get um, situations where you can run very large models um, in very uh, tight areas and run much higher blockage ratios than 10%. And as far as I'm aware, this is only unique to automotive testing. I don't think they do this in aircraft, although I could be wrong. Uh, this is a picture of one of the um, wind tunnel models. And what I want to highlight is kind of the level of detail um, on these models. And as you can see here on this model, they, they've even kind of designed a miniature radiator to kind of get the effects of the flow through the radiator and a miniature kind of engine block to get that effect as well. And partially this is driven by regulations. Uh, in this era of racing, uh, the rules are starting to get more and more restrictive. So that means that the gains you get are tinier and tinier, which means that you have to really be very, very precise on your uh, wind tunnel simulation. So your model has to be very, very accurate and also very expensive. And this is another picture of kind of the uh, wind tunnel radiator. I mean, sorry, the model radiator. Uh, and finally, I wanted to talk about uh, Swift engineering. And Swift engineering um, is probably uh, was California's finest wind tunnel um, during its time. It was formed in 1983 by David Bruns, Alex Cross, R.K. Smith, and Paul White. Um, its very first car, a Formula Ford, wins the SCA, SCCA championship in its debut season. Um, they were very famous for a lot of different um, uh, cars made for different Formula series, and they were very um, successful in the Atlantic series. Um, the company was bought by Hiro uh, Matsushita in um, 1991, and he, he was, uh, I think, a grandson of the founder of Panasonic. And after he bought the, uh, the company, um, they decided to build an F1 grade wind tunnel in 1993. And to give you an idea of why this is so special, this wind tunnel in 1993, I think cost three to $5 million to construct. And it was way um, over um, time constraint uh, to have it built. Um, and an F1 type uh, tunnel has to be very precise because the cars are so highly regulated that basically the gains are so tiny in the race car construction that every little detail has to be accounted for. And you need to really have a very, very precise wind tunnel. Um, their first uh, car for cart was designed in 97 um, and ends up winning its debut uh, race, which was very special. Now, this is a picture of the actual layout of the Swift wind tunnel. So. Uh, similar to the Caltech and San Diego State uh, tunnels, it's a closed return wind tunnel. Um, it's hard to see here, but where it's labeled two is um, actually, it has a heat exchanger here. So they can actually control the temperature of this wind tunnel, which is actually very important because you want to eliminate all sorts of variations as possible and temperature is one of them. Some brief specs on the Swift engineering wind tunnel. Um, as I said before, before, it was made to F1 specifications at that era. Uh, it was made in 1993. It had a 500 horsepower variable speed uh, motor that powered the fan. Um, the fan itself was designed by McDonnell Douglas. Now, its test section was very large, uh, nine feet wide by eight feet high by 22 feet long. And this tunnel also only did 40 to 50% scale models, but it had such a large um, test section and their philosophy was that rather than dealing with some of the uncertainties of slotted walls, that they would just build much larger uh, cross sections so that they didn't have to worry as much about um, the blockage issues and also introduce uh, an unwanted effect into the wind tunnel. So its test speed was uh, anywhere from 40 to 140 miles an hour. Uh, and its rolling road is eight feet wide by 16 feet long. Um, all assembly and fabrication was done by Swift Engineering employees. And I thought this was really cool. Um, David Bruns, the founder of Swift, uh, actually designed most of this wind tunnel uh, along with Bob Liebig. And um, as far as I'm aware, this is um, David Bruns' first and only large scale wind tunnel project. So it's quite amazing that he was able to design something of this scale and magnitude um, on his first go and it'd be so successful. 
And Bob Liebeck is a very, uh, he's a Boeing fellow and he's very well respected in the traditional aerospace um, community. And he had a large part to do in this design as well. Now this, these next couple of photos kind of give you the idea of the scale of this, uh, the size of this wind tunnel. Um, so here you can see the, the wind tunnel motor itself uh, in relation to the, the rest of um, part of the wind tunnel construction. Uh, this is the contraction cone. So this is this connects the square profile of the wind tunnel to the circular profile of the fan itself. Uh, these are some of the turning vanes uh, on the corners of the wind tunnel, and these were made by a local uh, vendor uh, to San Clemente. This is the nozzle itself that accelerates the airflow. And again, you can see how large it is. Um, if I'm correct, these were made out of fiberglass, and I'm not sure if they were made in-house at Swift or uh, if they were made by a local contractor, but um, this, from what I remember when I talked to David Bruns, this was a, kind of a challenging part of the design of this wind tunnel. Uh, this shows that the nozzle being put together, and as you can see again, it's quite large, and this is all made out of wood too, other than the, the actual uh, contraction part of the nozzle. Um, this is the construction of the test section itself, and this test section has a similar uh, philosophy to the All-American Racers te test section, where um, the, the strut is uh, not connected to the uh, wind tunnel um, main structure as well to eliminate some of that vibration. And SWIFT has a very important connection with the F1 world because its location in San Clemente meant that it was far away from the rest of the F1 teams meaning that a Formula One team could come to Swift Engineering, do an entire wind tunnel uh, program and not uh, have anything leak out to the rest of the F1 teams. So that was one of their advantages that they had. Um, this tunnel was used by Adrian Newey when he was at Williams, while Williams was building their own tunnel. And it was also used by Jaguar Racing, which eventually became Red Bull Racing um, while they were developing their wind tunnel as well. And another connection is through Dirk de Beer. And Dirk de Beer, for those that don't know, um, has a long history uh, in Aero and F1. And he currently, he's the head of Aero at Alpine, but he started his career at Swift and he was hired to do the wind tunnel calibration at Swift. Now, this is an example of one of the many uh, wind tunnel models at Swift Engineering. Um, and what I'd like to show here is kind of like the really, a lot of the thought that was put into the design of this wind tunnel. Like for example, these struts um, are streamlined so that their interference is very minimal uh, with the rest of the flow field. Uh, as you can see here, there's also what appears to be like a load cell. So they were able to read the, the tire lift values um, on this wind tunnel setup. So this is one of the later cars that Swift developed. This is the Formula Nippon car. And one thing I'd like to highlight is that um, now they're getting into the era of using 3D printing on their wind tunnel model construction. And so this was a fairly new thing back um, in the era when this was being built, because up until then, wind tunnel models were made with wood, uh, carbon fiber, uh, or, or metal. Um, 3D printing was a, a very new idea at the time. Nowadays, this is very commonplace, and it gives a lot of advantage in wind tunnel construction, model construction. And finally, like uh, kind of ending off in the Swift story, um, Swift was also actually uh, a huge pioneer in CFD. They're one of the first uh, people to really invest in uh, a supercomputer. I think the Cray supercomputer of the days um, and really in a uh, huge CFD capability. And kind of um, they were looking at a really important thing. If you think about where F1 and IndyCar regulations are heading today, this idea of designing a car for overtaking. Well, Swift was looking at this uh, back in the early 2000s, I believe, or mid 2000s, um, where they were thinking about how they could design a car in such a way that the vortices that come off the rear wing in the under tray don't create this huge wake in the following car. Uh, so I thought that was just a really cool um, idea and kind of shows like how kind of ahead of their time uh, Swift was. Now, um, towards the end of my presentation, we get to kind of a bittersweet moment because California has this huge history in race car aerodynamics development. But nowadays, all these tunnels that I just talked about, uh, with the exception of San Diego State, uh, no longer exist. Um, the race car aerodynamics industry uh, basically kind of died um, at 
the turn of the millennium. So my question and my challenge um, now is, can we build a new legacy? Um, uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo has the, the original Dan Gurney Rolling Road and Cal State Fullerton is building their own and the San Diego State has still has the excellent facility that Dr. Katz used. So can we build a new facility and um, a new kind of legacy of automotive aerodynamics testing? And I leave that as an open question for some of uh, the younger uh, people in the audience today. And so uh, to end with, I wanna just give a lot of thanks and appreciation to the many people who helped me with this presentation. Um, from the Petroleum Museum, uh, Kathy Shannon for giving me pictures of um, Jim Hall's car. Uh, Dr. Joseph Katz at San Diego State for giving me time to interview him. Um, from Electro Motive, uh, Trevor Harris and Chris Willis. From All American Racers, uh, Trevor Harris and Mark Page. And from Swift Engineering, Chris Bernal, Mark Page, and David Brunts. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions now. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, we have some compliments in the in the uh, in the comments section, but in the quest question and answer section, we have uh, two main questions. Uh, I think you covered a lot of information. So, uh, number one was how important is a rolling road in wind tunnel testing for validating CFD results? Um. I'd say very important. And this also depends on what you're trying to do. Um, now, if you're doing ground effects work, I would say there is no point in not doing a rolling road wind tunnel test, in my opinion, um, just because ground effects type uh, work is heavily reliant on having that boundary condition correct. But if you're doing above a vehicle, uh, a CFD validation work or aeroacoustic work, uh, you don't necessarily uh, need a rolling road uh, wind tunnel, in my opinion. But I, I, you know, there might be others that disagree with that. Sweet. Um, another question from the audience is, uh, what are some ways to simulate cornering conditions using wind tunnels? And is it worth the complex complexities that come with this challenge? Um, okay, that's a great question, um, which I didn't, uh, unfortunately, cover on this one. Uh, this section. Now, the, um, the most common way it's done nowadays is they actually tilt the entire rolling road bed, they angle it. Um, and in, in that way, they can kind of get some of the yaw characteristics, but it's still not 100% correct. Um, but that's how it's mainly done. Um, there was a concept that I think they were exploring at Cal Poly, I think, or someone affiliated with Cal Poly. I read about a long time ago where they, ac they actually designed a miniature wind tunnel where the car could replicate the true cornering condition, but I don't know if they ever expanded upon that. So it's been done, but um, it's still an area that's kind of hard, uh, I'd say, to do. Excellent. If there are any other questions, uh, please enter them now. But like I said, I think you covered a lot of material today. It's a very interesting presentation. Okay. Yes, hello, Darius and Ramey. Great job, great presentation. It looks like uh, the question is are sort of still dwindling in. So it looks like another one just chimed in, Darius. This one so is... Uh, can you comment on Swift's use of 3D printing uh, in 1997? 1997. Um, to be honest, I uh, specific dates I don't know too well. Um, I, I do know that they were exploring wind tunnel. I mean, uh, 3D printing, and like a lot of the pictures are that I was given, I, I didn't have a good time reference, so I don't know exactly. Um, how much they were doing. Um, perhaps if anyone maybe can chime in on that. If I don't know if there's anyone the participants that can chime in on that. Um, yeah. But on, on the same note, uh, when you're designing a model, 
how important is the material selection? Oh, very important. Um, and uh, to give an example of this, actually, uh, I, I showed that 124 scale uh, test that I had done. So I learned this the hard way. I actually had designed this uh, wind tunnel test and I thought at such a small scale and the speeds that we were running at that um, I wouldn't have to really uh, consider a lot of the deflections and loadings. And one thing when we ran the test that we found was that uh, the, the splitter was actually making so much downforce that it was separating from the plastic body of the car. Um, so even at this 124 scale, um, the deflections matter a lot. So um, a big part of uh, wind tunnel model design is actually figuring out um, what the loads may be and getting um, materials that are stiff enough in order to um, kind of hold up those loads and not deflect in ways that aren't realistic to um, the true car. And then to like switch the question around, uh, what materials are you commonly used in the construction of the wind tunnel itself? I noticed a lot of wood. Uh, yeah, so I would say um, the ones I've seen are mainly wood. I know the Cal State Fullerton one, uh, the main structure itself uh, is steel and then the internal parts are wood. Um, I think some are probably the more modern ones are probably uh, steel and composite. Um, but I don't know the specifics of kind of the more modern wind tunnels, like what they're doing nowadays. Okay. Another uh, question from the audience is, uh, have you, uh, has the NASCAR community adopted rolling road approach to their wind tunnel testing? Uh, yes. So, um, and a great question, uh, by the way. Um, so probably the most famous, uh, automotive wind tunnel nowadays in the United States is one called Windshear in North Carolina. And this is a full scale rolling road facility. And it is very hard to get time to test in Windshear because a lot of the NASCAR teams are testing on here a lot. So there, there are two main, from what I understand, there are two main tunnels that NASCAR teams use. They use the wind, Windshear facility and another facility called, um, I'm not sure if it's A1 or A2, but it, it's another facility that also has another way of replicating uh, the ground effect condition. Uh, they don't use a rolling road, they use a suction system, which isn't as good, but it's another way of doing it. But uh, NASCAR is, is heavily uh, uh, using uh, this type of technology. And there's actually a lot of aero development that happens in NASCAR. Yeah, another question from the audience is a little bit more technical. Uh, the movement of the center of pressure has always been a challenge. What advances have been made in the study of the mitigation of CP? Oh, geez. Uh, um, I don't. I don't have a good way of we, answering. We can this. always. Yeah, no problem. This one sounds like a doozy. We can always uh, answer this question after. Yeah, this might be one I might have to kind of get back to you on, um, to be honest. No uh, problem. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience is, are, what are some common ways to deal with challenges regarding surface roughness and geometrically uh, similar boundary layers for scaled models? Uh, sorry, uh, say that again? Can you comment on some common ways to deal with challenges regarding surface roughness? And then the second part is uh, geometrically similar boundary layers for scaled models. Um, good question, but uh, this one, I think I'm also gonna have to get back to you on. <laughs> uh, no worries. Looks like we're winding down, fellas. Uh, Randy, you had mentioned uh, shouting out uh, Cal State Fullerton or some contact uh, information for the university. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Just, um, yeah. If anyone's interested in, um, if you're uh, thinking about a bachelor's or master's degree and you're kind of interested in race car aerodynamics, uh, we're trying to uh, kind of build up our kind of rolling road um, design facility. So 
Um, just uh, if you're interested, uh, consider the program, I, I would say. Uh, just it's, um, they don't advertise it very well, but it's something in my opinion that's very exciting that they're working on. Okay, great, great information, great presentation. Uh, thanks again, Darius and Remy for pulling this together. Um, I guess I can go into a close, but uh, I did want to say personally, thank to you two gentlemen. Thank you. Big thanks to Rami. I know it's a lot of uh, a lot of effort was put into this massive presentation. Oh, thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun to do, um, and it was really fun to kind of hear the stories of uh, all these innovators. Okay, with that being said, I'll go into our, our closing slide. I just wanted to remind the participants on how to reach out to SAE SoCal, our section itself. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel as we look to boost our, our content. This presentation will be archived there. So if someone you know may have missed it, uh, please feel free to forward them the information. And it's also uh, archived for, for future going as well. Um, the October 25th and 26th, we have SAE International Resume Clinic for, for university students. Uh, and that information can be found uh, through our SAE International website. And then also on November 9th, we have a future webinar with the Art Center College of Design. Uh, and they'll be discussing uh, the intersection between art and engineering with regards to transportation design. So look for more information and details on our website, www.sasocal.org. Thank you everyone for participating and I think we'll wrap it. See you next time. Thank you very much, it was great.